Hey there. Hey. How's it going? Good. Let's see. Oh, look. I didn't even have to really configure that. Good. It's impressive. I'm still going to have to configure it a little bit, just the window, but not too much. How are you doing today? R running around like a chick of my head cut off, but it's good. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Ding dong. Someone's at the door. I'm, I'm a space wizard now. <laughs> Hopefully people can hear you. Can you guys hear him okay? <clears throat> Fraser Space Wizard, precisely on time. He is, yeah, yep. Uh, weird. The lighting's still kind of crazy here. I put a new lighting set up and it's a little hot still, so I gotta figure this out. Apologies in advance. Well, see, now you know why I don't have the green screens. <laughs> like the, the lighting from the green screens in my this room, too hot. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's what you were referencing. Well, the problem is I can turn the it down, but then you get a flicker. So it's not oh. it's not ideal. Like the gain? Is that what you mean? Or the exposure? I can turn I can turn down the brightness of the LEDs mm -hmm. in the room and the problem is that it uh Yeah. Yeah. That I can mess with it. Anyway, uh next time we'll sort it out. Next so I, time, I'm going to look completely, uh, completely bright. Is can everybody hear him okay now? Do I need to adjust the volume more? Because I can. Um, that Fraser finally uses a transporter. <laughs> Sound is good. Good, good. So I was just. I'm, I'm never getting in one of those things. <laughs> um, I was just telling people about how astrology is fake news. You probably heard some of that. Uh, fake news? No, I didn't hear it. With with astrology, modern day astrology, how it's fake news. We were reading an article by Phil Plate from when he used to write for Slate. I guess that's a way to describe non. Is that is that how we describe nonsense now? Is fake news? Yeah, that's why we have okay. the. Yes, yeah, it's, it's total fake news. Yeah, that's why we have that emote. It's actually defined by people saying that we didn't go to the moon. They like to say that that's fake news, but then they apply it to everything. At least here on Twitch. Fake news is a is a is a meme here on Twitch. I I do I don't even like the term, but I, I I understand I understand that this is this is sort of the way people describe things. So I will uh, I'll be I'll be cool with it. But but Astrology. but wait wait but wait. So I, why don't well I'm curious why don't you like the term? Well, because I mean I think that fake news is 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 a really wide bucket that describes like things I don't like uh -huh. to nonsense peddling to actual attempts to write deceiving news to clickbait to all these things, right? right. Space news, oh, sorry, fake news, not space news. <laughs> fake news is like whatever you want it to be, which is not a great way to describe anything. So I don't like the term. Oh, you think like it's too subjective. Yeah, like everyone just kind of goes like, that's fake news. And then you're like, okay, so now let's do some definitions. What do you mean when someone says something's fake news? And you're like, oh, there's a Macedonian uh, content factory that's creating incorrect stories to try and get as much clickbait as they can. Right. As opposed to uh, there's pseudoscience that's being peddled by people who are making money off their conspiracy theories. Or, oh, uh, there is a... Uh, people who are misled by misunderstanding of uh, scientific research or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And that's all. So if you just say fake news, then, it, it is, it but, is but, I, but it could be that I just like, haven't watched enough of the stream to really understand all the memes. And if astrology is fake news that I'm on board here. Yeah. Modern day, you. modern day, because yeah. astrology, you know, astrologers back in the day were our, were the astronomers. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, it, it was, there was a there was like no difference between an astrologer and astronomer for the longest time. Right. And it's only in recent times where where one group stopped making stuff up. That's all. Yeah, and and and, and do we know? Like, I don't even know the times on that. That'd be interesting to know when that actually flipped. Well, I mean, even Newton saw himself as an astrologer and a um, alchemist. Mm -hmm. So 
I would say, you know, it started to switch. I mean, all of these things really started to switch with the rise, you know, during the Renaissance and really with the, the, the rise of the scientific method, right? The scientific method is this machine that attempts to reject nonsense. And once you actually follow the scientific method, it's really hard to drag that, that nonsense along. So I would say, you know, really 1700s, 1800s mm -hmm. is, is when the scientific method became this really good self-reinforcing, well adhered to methodology. Yeah. And, and that's pretty recent considering the yeah, just, whole just a few hundred history years. of all this. Yeah. Someone yeah. says, what about the Asian Zodiac with the mythical dragon? If you, if you think the positions of the stars are in any way causing uh, events to happen here on Earth or affect your personality, uh, it's nonsense. So, exactly. Sorry, there's no evidence Is that cooking... any of these things are real. <laughs> uh, someone says it's cooking alchemy. It's chemistry. It's chemistry. Yeah. Cooking, al cooking is chemistry. Absolutely. There's a great show. Uh, oh, man. With Alton Brown. I'm, someone's going to say it in the chat and I forget the name of it. But it's all it's a it's a chemistry show. But mm -hmm. it's, he does it with cooking. And it's great. Good eats. There you go. Thanks. Oh, yeah. We we have uh, Mike Sai here on. He's a part of Brain Bites. And he he does he does cooking streams and talks about the science behind it. Yeah, yeah, tons of science. So cooking is is a really fascinating, just is is chemistry in action, and uh, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why my kids used to love Good Eats, like when they were just like little kids, because it was it was like a science show. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading through chat. I, I need to get so much better at this because I, I heard what you said, but like I, I'm like, yeah, that sounds great. Like yeah, sounds I heard great. You whatever said, you said. <laughs> you said that your kids loved Good Eats. And yeah. I'm like sitting here reading chat at the same time, but I'm like, hold on, let me. <laughs> um, good job, Fraser. Uh, D Dunn says hello, by the way. Um, what else? The supernova that seeded the pre-solar nebula affected my life. Yeah, totally did. <laughs> yep. In that it provided you the basic uh, chemicals that life needed to be able to get going here on Earth. And if it didn't happen, then you wouldn't exist. We but, wouldn't I mean, exist. If you, if you want to sort of look back in time and find all the things that needed to have happened for you to exist, I mean, you could just go on forever. Yeah. I mean, think about the fact that, you know, we are, we are at the end of an enormous line of successful mating partners. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, it's Every one hell single of one a, of them. One hell of a to do list. To, yeah. <laughs> to find a mate and pass on their genes again and again, all the way through to the first life form on earth. Um, speaking of supernova, did you, did you hear, I think you were here. We're, well, maybe you were here. We were, there was that whole supernova, um, S in, what was it? Um, the cow one. Yeah. The cow one. Yeah. Did you look into I, that? I haven't looked into this yet. No. Uh, after I saw it on the stream, I did a little bit of digging and there was like some, some people who do some supernova, um, uh, sort of follow-up studies, things like that. They, posted on it but apart from that uh haven't really seen any more press releases and information but sometimes this is how this happens is right is you know there'll, there'll be a really interesting discovery or a really interesting observation but i mean these things are happening all the time right the automated telescopes the supernova researchers they're finding this stuff all the time and then someone will will kind of go no, no no this is interesting enough that someone should write a press release about it. And so you get this sort of this first run where people who are, you know, the kind of the super nerds like me are kind of watching these really obscure places and these weird places that people talk about this stuff. And then another, then you get like the, the press officers for the various universities that were involved. Actually, they'll write something you get and they'll try to explain it in a more, you know, accessible way. Yeah. I, I haven't checked on it recently, but I think, you know, I had uh, Paul look at it, and and I thought I, I thought at first maybe it was just a, a gamma ray burst, but it seemed like it wasn't in the end. And I don't think it was actually a supernova event at all. Yeah, I haven't. Um, I haven't. It'd be again, interesting. I, I have not looked into this one. We had a we had a bunch of big news events happen yesterday. No, and that kept us pretty busy. Um, so James, I haven't, I'm, James Webb. James Webb. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and Oumuamua 
Oh, right, right. Yeah, Oumuamua yeah. being a comet instead of an asteroid, yeah. which yeah. I I mean, are you shocked? Yes. Really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this was the... So, I mean, there have been interstellar comets discovered in the past. Right. And so when they found the movement of Oumuamua, it really looked like an asteroid. It, it, it had the the kind of, it didn't have a tail, it didn't have a coma, it right. didn't have a lot of the features that a comet, you would expect a comet to have. And so the astronomers who were observing it sort of ruled it out as a comet right away and went to asteroid. And if it's an asteroid, then it's the first time an interstellar asteroid has been seen. But um, the, sort of the new observations, they've been tracking its movement through the solar system. And what they found was that it, it, it is moving like a comet because comets are are blasting out sort of jets of material. Yeah. You know, they're venting off gas into space. Right. And so it's doing, it's moving to a new, you know, it's sort of moved itself into a new orbit. So that was pretty fascinating, right? Mm -hmm. And so then it means, okay, so maybe this is just a comet after all. It's not an, it's not an asteroid, it's a comet. And then the question then is, what could have caused the venting, but it wasn't visible? And so some of the theories are that it was venting gas of like a different size, like the particles were a different size than mm -hmm. the kinds of comets than we than we normally have. So so it's, it's a very fascinating discovery, and it's too bad that we can't make any more observations, right? Oumuamua is gone, it's, yeah, and we'll never be able to observe it in a new kind of way. Right. So hopefully astronomers are going to be able to piece together out of the details. We'll never be sure. Uh, <laughs> Lodi asks, you know, Oumuamua was the silver surfer. Convince me otherwise. Uh, only that it moved like a comet and not like an asteroid or a silver surfer. So that's the only evidence that we've got. Uh, Joe says, is it confirmed to be out of the solar system? Not right now. No, and it's not going to be out of the solar system <clears throat> for, for a while. tens of thousands of years. For but a good while. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there is, yeah, so it, again, there's the difference between, you know, asteroids can have some of the material locked down subsurface, whereas comets can have that on, on the surface frozen, and that, that yeah, material can yeah. get ionized as it goes near the sun, and you get these these colors, these, you know, you can get this split tail um, in the, in the coma, um, of what that stuff is, but I don't know. I, I, you know, I can't say that, um, I, you know, I, I was aware that it was deemed an asteroid, uh, and you know, that, that whole thing about the particles, I haven't been able to read any of those articles that, that have come in, but I've seen them There's just two flooding. big press releases. One came out of the European Southern Observatory and right. one came out of the European Space Agency talking about some, some Hubble observations. So, and the, you know, the European Space Agency is the, sorry, the, the European Southern Observatory, those are the biggest telescopes in the world. They do some of the best public outreach and best sort of science, uh, publicity out there and so they've done a really great job some brand new pictures of of what they think it looks like showing what its orbit is and you know i mean if they're convinced that's where you have to start i should rephrase that joe says it is yeah it, is it, it yeah. came from outside the so its orbit is still hyperbolic it still came from outside the solar system and it's still going outside the solar system the fact that it's giving off these jets means that it's a little more difficult to trace where it came from so that's the challenge now is that in the past if it was just simple play you know orbital mechanics you could try to calculate where it had come from before it reached the solar system but now because if it is a, a comet that it is putting out gas is inventing then it could have hidden or sort of changed the the nature of its orbit yeah and um <clears throat> what was i going to add to that there was oh yeah so there there's been some some talk about it coming from a, a system where there was binary star uh, the binary star system right right and so now this puts all that question into you know all that into doubt because you just you just can't know where it came from right they're right. unpredictable rogues they don't play by the rules yep and this is one of them and that's why it was really really cool um we got really excited about it uh and so that's yeah and and so moving on to the the james webb space telescope stuff i know you're probably not shocked <laughs> no and and if you actually watch my last video you guys did watch my last video so the one that we did about uh 
two weeks ago about the next big telescopes coming, I said, James Webb is, is expected to launch in May 2019 or May 2020. Mm -hmm. But I said, but come on, you know, that's going to be delayed again. And yep. Yep. So, human human so, error. Or Yeah. Well, so good news and bad news, right? The good news is James Webb is not getting canceled. It's still getting developed and it's going to launch. Right. Bad news. Uh, James Webb is uh, over budget, late. There are all kinds of systematic problems in the um, in the in the project management in in the way they've been been working on the telescope over uh, at Northrop Grumman, and so they're recommending that they push the telescope back to March of 2021. Right. So, so another nine months from when they originally thought they were going to launch it. Uh, journey started said that the James do you really think it will launch well so they said an 80 percent confidence yeah so that's yeah that's not great you know but again no but I you mean you want them to do it right <laughs> yeah In well you end, want them to do you it want right them to and, be right yeah and there was a you know this is this is after a very big independent report looked at this the true state of the development of the of the telescope and sort of asked everyone and looked at their project plans and looked at how much they had had done and um, asked all of these, you know, really important questions and kind of got in everybody's business to really get to the bottom of it. And one of these, you know, an audit like that, you kind of can't hide any more secrets under the rug. So, so I feel like, like knowing this, is good and it you know i think we can feel pretty confident that the march that march date is is a lot more realistic than the dates that have been coming up to this point you know whenever you hear that people are working long hours they are trying to compress their timelines they're you know i mean you come from the computer world you know how this works right mm -hmm. like like it's a project management problem that adding more engineers to a late project just makes it later Right. So there's a certain point where you have to just let all of the tasks that you've put in place just unfurl themselves and, and everything come together. And at this point, there, there comes this magic part where you're working on a project, especially like a big software project, where, where you finally know what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. You finally know what's left. And it may be a sort of an incomprehensible amount of work, but at least you know what's left. And that feels to me like that's what they've got to now is they know what's outstanding. They know how much time the various people are going to need. And it's just going to take as much time as it takes. And then it's going to launch. And so the good news of the good news is they're not going to cancel it. You know, they're already eight plus billion dollars in. They're going to spend another 800 million at least, and they're going to launch it. So at this point, I feel pretty I mean, just I feel pretty comfortable, like the people working on it did a pretty rigorous evaluation. And so we'll see what happens. Yeah, that's probably the only real solace that I take in any of this is that it is going to be such an impressive telescope and it's going to do so much that, and Eludriel said in all caps, it's worth the wait. It absolutely is. It's going to be, you don't want them to push something out there and be like, oh, well, now it's at Lagrange point two. We can't do anything about it, guys. Sorry. Yeah. Um, it's not Hubble where we can send people to go and fix it. Um, yep. This is this is a different kind of beast. And so as much as I get disappointed because I want to see cool stuff, um, that's just me being instant gratification-y and, you know, not, yeah. not necessarily. Yeah. And, I mean, you look what happened, all the trials and tribulations that happened with the Hubble Space Telescope. Right. And here we are decades after the thing launched after they've already sent two missions up to repair it and we're grateful for it every day it's the most productive important scientific instrument that human beings have ever launched and this one's six times bigger mm -hmm. so uh and graham hw is asking like if northrop grumman makes mistakes while building it don't they have to pay for it the problem is is that with a lot of these contracts it's done with a it's what's called cost plus accounting. So they they sign with a contractor, but the contractor says it's there are all kinds of uncertainties and we don't know how how hard this is going to be. You're asking for us to invent new technologies, you know, the unfolding sunshade, the 
you know, this whole thing has to be able to fit inside an Ariane 5 rocket. So, so we don't know how much this is going to cost. We don't know how long it's going to take. And so NASA understands that and so they do what's called cost plus. So they just say, you work on it and whatever your costs are, you put in a reasonable profit margin and, and we'll pay those bills as you continue to work on it. Um, and you can see that that has, that has an upside, like, uh, you know, again, like whenever I've, if you're honest and you're working as hard and as carefully as you can on a project, then the cost plus accounting is a very, it's a very good way to do a, a project because you as the, as the, you know, say you run a software company and somebody wants to hire you to buy some, to make some software and you say, well, like, I don't really know what it's going to take, but well, let's just start and we'll see as long as you keep paying the bills, we will keep building the software for you. That can be very effective. Mm -hmm. It gets the right software built as long as the customer is willing to kind of go through it. But it's also a way for money to just get hidden for projects to run over budget for people to, you know, to for projects to go long and projects go over budget. And yeah. the other way, right, is you do like a fixed price and you just say, I don't care. You deliver us the James Webb for $1.2 billion. And, and if it costs you more, then it doesn't matter. And the problem then is the company tries to build it. They can't build it. They deliver garbage and they go bankrupt, right? right? And then you don't get your you don't get your spacecraft. So, so they both have their advantages. And in this case, you know, we're seeing a what should have been a two billion dollars telescope turn into a roughly nine, nine billion yeah, telescope. nine nine billion. And 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 with with Hubble, someone asked, um, so you may know how expensive. I know that it started every so every telescope you know that's being built is going to start off with a lower figure than what ends up happening not necessarily there's been a ton of projects that have come in on time on budget look at uh i mean look at tests right tests oh, right. was Tess, delivered right but like hubble it but wasn't it, it around like maybe like I, I forget and i'm gonna just shoot this off the top of my head so everybody can shoot me down but maybe like 500 billion or not 500 billion wow 500 million yeah i don't know what the I haven't really looked into the sort of the history of the Hubble Space Telescope and what the budgets were. I think it was on, a, a on that one, but that? it definitely went over budget. Yeah. And again, if you're if you're trying to break new ground, if you're trying to make something that is technically uncertain, right? Then you're going to go. You're more likely to go over budget than in any other situation. Yeah, and I think I think with Hubble, you know, it was I think it was around five hundred million, and then. Um, you know, at some point, like not including like the first of the first repair of it, I think was like that alone was around 1 billion, just the repair. Yeah. And so I think, you know, by it's, it's, you know, I would say maybe 10 years ago, it was, it was the figure just kept increasing to where it was around, you know, almost like 5 billion. Yeah. But, but yeah. So I, I guess I'm meaning in terms of like these big space telescopes, these huge ones, um, yeah. cause Tess, you're right. Tess, Tess was great and i mean there was people but asking, i mean it's it's a finder scope right right, right. like tess is tiny right and tess has you know it does one really specific thing and that's it true yeah yeah absolutely well, james webb is a is a swiss army knife that'll be able to do almost anything 500 billion let's go i think like i think hubble. yeah i think actually it, it towards the end you know um hubble might have you know like tapped out at about you know 10 billion but like again there's so many there was repairs and then servicing yeah. um and also when when hubble hubble is slowly the the space telescope guys not talking about the person it's named after because that person's long gone but that one is slowly falling into earth right hubble a space telescope yeah 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 and and so there's probably going to be something I, I think they're talking about that that some kind of um, mission where they could kind of guide it a little bit. Yeah, so the, it it has the ability to deorbit itself on board now. So probably by twenty twenty eight or so, they'll they'll probably have to deorbit it, gotcha. or it'll crash into the atmosphere in an, in an unknown location, or they'll boost it again and keep using it. I I wouldn't be surprised if they boost it again. Like it's like as long as it keeps working, they'll keep using it. Yeah, and it's an incredible thing. Like Hubble is 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 never even today it's still just an incredible telescope that we learned so much yeah. from um how hard is a telescope to make it's a light and a lens okay <laughs> in space in space right in so like space. just everything it's always you know like how hard is anything to do and then you just add in space yeah 
Exactly. Just that I like that. I like that yeah. a lot. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and Hibernation Pro- Prophet is asking, like, how much better can a telescope get than we have now? Um, James Webb is almost as big as some of the biggest observatories we have on Earth, right? Like the biggest telescopes, like the Grand Canaria, the the Keck observatories, those are 10 meters. Mm-hmm. And James Webb, I forget, I forget the exact number, what is it, 7.6? So it's super close to being as big as those. So it's imagine taking the biggest observatory on Earth and then making it capable of flying to space, unfolding in space and being able to transmit information back to Earth. It's a it's a mind bending accomplishment. But we're you know, as we see bigger and bigger launch providers like what SpaceX is providing with the BFR, Mm -hmm. then you've got things like you could put a you know, maybe you don't have to make as complicated a telescope because now you've just got this gigantic powerful rocket that can just you know you just you just go in to have it scoop up the keck observatory put it inside the bfr and just fly it to space right yeah not quite not but, quite you know um and yeah some uh john said the hardest part uh for spacecraft is launch vibration and g loading true like yeah. they have to do and- so many shake tests yeah, and so uh, the next video that we should be dropping today mm-hmm. um, is all about building things in space from stuff from space. So, you know, living off the land in space. And there's a great, and we I think we talked about this last week, right? There's this really great mission called Arconaut that's in development. And it's a 3D printer with, it's a space ship, but it's a 3D printer and it's got three arms. And it extrudes um girders mm-hmm. and then and then uses its little arms to grab them and construct them into structures and so if you don't need to go through all that shake test if you can just like build the thing in space uh-huh. and then it makes things a lot simpler so oh, yeah yeah and and you know that 3d printing stuff is a real thing like uh yeah you know, that's that's kind of an amazing thing i've seen a lot of yeah uh, kids, you know, build robots and stuff using 3D printing, and it's so cool. Yeah, so the thing, you just send it like like a bucket of aluminum, right, mm-hmm. of, of aluminum powder or titanium powder, and then it just it just uh, squirts out sort of trusses, and then it and then it bolts them together, and uh, and so it's a lot simpler. And then if you get that titanium powder from an asteroid. And it, there's a robot gathering up all of that titanium from that asteroid. Your life is even simpler because you never have to, br- never even had to bring that titanium from Earth. So that's the future. Yeah. And and we should get to a point where the only thing that we're launching into space is, you know, human beings. Yep. And, and just, that that's and that's it. That's that would be wait wait let's see, let's see, three D pr- uh, printed houses are a thing. Yeah, they are. I saw that actually. That's really yeah. weird. But I saw and that. 3D, someone saying, yeah, and 3D printing a moon based with regolith. Yeah, people are, people have demonstrated building um, regolith buildings. So that technology exists as well. Uh, Hannah Banana says, I worked on the maglev development at mm-hmm. Sussex University a long time ago. This was intended as a launch method for yeah. very large payloads. Shame nobody yeah, it's a great. I mean, it's a method. great idea, right? You use a, a like a a rail gun and you launch payloads into space. Now, it doesn't get you all the way to space because you have to go sort of so fast that you're going to be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere from the inside, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to be going the same speed that a that a re-entry would go. But so one of the ideas is you have this gigantic tube that lifts it up above the majority of the Earth's atmosphere, so that when the the thing is accelerated it blasts them out into into space you're above that the main part of the atmosphere uh and then the other challenge is that you can't launch something to space with one kick so you know if you if you send a even the most powerful maglev unless you send it on an escape trajectory it's going to return to earth so you've got to have some kind of way to thrust the cargo once it's reached um apoapsis once it's reached the top of its of its uh, trajectory. So you you blast it out. It reaches the top of its trajectory. It then circularizes its orbit, and then it's in space. The other problem, of course, is it's only good for cargo. So um, 
you you know the the kinds of g-forces involved are ridiculous unless you build a 200 kilometer long launch track right. but there's a company called spin launch that's recently started up and they just got a 40 million dollar investment and they're going to be doing a catapult a space catapult so they're gonna they're gonna run uh their their spacecraft they kind of look like warheads they kind of look like like bombs uh -huh. around this track really really quickly and then release them and use that as a way to get a lot of the velocity that they need yeah, i just found a space.com article on that it's yeah. kind of a, yeah there so there was a recent thing with it yeah they raised 40 million dollars yeah wow <laughs> Yeah, so so that's so people think that's a serious way to get things to orbit. No, no question. Um, yeah, a trebuchet is clearly the superior yeah. siege weapon. Yeah, yeah, but I I think that we're at a point now when you look at the cost of the BFR that that's probably going to be at the end of the day the most successful, inexpensive way to get things to space, and then eventually the next version of that. Um, I did the math. And a BFR, if it if they get the cost down as much as they think, uh -huh. it'll be cheaper than people have been estimating space elevators will cost. So, so that's it, right? The BFR is, you know, these big multi-stage reusable rockets are the cheapest. You way just to do this. you just took other words and put it in for the F, but it's okay. <laughs> what? You said the cheapest, so the big, and then you gave you gave Two other oh, descriptors, and then you said the, <laughs> the big, fabulous rocket. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, Reddit, they did the math. Yeah. Um, what is the sub goal under sky? Oh, so yeah, it's it's a goal for the day for for subs and resubs. So to to say. Like so someone that. should sub. That <laughs> number should be turned into a five. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait. Um, <laughs> It's a very humble sub goal for someone. Yeah, it's small. It's actually small. Usually people set those to like 10 or 20 and I don't get that. So I don't want to be sad. <laughs> I don't want to be sad. So it's realistic. Um, BFR is awesome. Maglev was a good idea for steam age stuff in the early 90s. But with today's super delicate yeah. equipment, no way you could launch that stuff. Yeah, I mean, Maglev. if they pull it off, right, mm -hmm. then, then the BFR... It refuels itself from the air, right? Mm -hmm. So, so it just it has a solar powered factory that pulls carbon dioxide out of the air, uses it to manufacture methane, and then is refueled. The top and the bottom half of it are both fully reusable. Both can go to space. Both return to their landing pad, <laughs> like it's. It is the most efficient way to get cargo into space at this point with a minimum amount of infrastructure, right? You're not having to go and find an asteroid and park it in in high orbit and reel unobtainium down and bolt it down to the ground to make a space elevator, right? Like it's right. just, it's a, it's a really straightforward way to go to to get to the next step of space exploration and i think it's gonna it's gonna dominate you know and then we're gonna just see bigger and more powerful better versions of it once it finally launches and i think it's it's gonna gut the launch market because it's cheaper to put your cubesat in a bfr than it is to hire kind of anyone else to do anything DPI says, is it realistic that they'd manage to push 150 tons to Mars transfer orbit? I don't know what their, their specific costs are. I don't think it'll do 150 tons to a Mars transfer orbit. Um, I don't even think it'll do 150 tons to low Earth orbit. Well, maybe it'll do 150 tons to low Earth orbit for full reusability. Mm -hmm. So it'll do full reusability there's some amount. And then if you want to burn the thing up, it'll go even heavier. Someone's asking <laughs> twice now. D Dunn's asked twice. When am I going to Australia? I leave for Australia next Tuesday. I won't be here next Thursday, by the way, because I'll be in Australia. Um, What's going on down weeks. under? Yeah, yeah. And then what I'm are, doing, are you doing a talk. Uh, so there's a conference called Space Stuff, Star Stuff, in Byron Bay, on the 7th and 8th of July. Uh -huh. And uh, I'll be there. 
Uh, Amy Shira Title is going to be there. Uh, Jeff Notkin, Meteorite Man is going to be there. And a bunch of Australian, famous Australian uh, astronomer people are going to be there. And we're going to uh, have a couple of days of space nerdery. That's and I'm awesome. going to talk about how we're living in the golden age of astronomy. Because we can see stuff? Well, because and we can technology? see more things than we've ever seen. And there's all these really cool, um, really cool observatories that are coming very shortly. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, there will, ha there has never been a greater time for astronomy. And now we've got gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's just a really good time for astronomy and it's getting even better. Yeah. Gravitational you know, waves opened up a huge thing. Yeah. And I mean, the, the one that I'm most excited about, if I had to pick one mission, one thing it's the large synoptic survey telescope right that's the one that i think is gonna is going to just fountain new discoveries faster than anything out there so um and that's only 20 we're only about two years away from that so ooh, gravitons now that's sexy science right there um Let's see. So what can you imagine the guy who has totally been wait, totally been going to the bank for a loan to start up his space drilling company projected to start as soon as civilian vacation trips go live in the estimated 2020? Well, I mean, both are going to be required, right? I mean, you've got the the space tourism side of things as a way for people to try and fund their spaceship companies. And then you've got the the mining side of things. And there's two companies, right? There's Deep Space Industries and there's uh, Planetary Resources. And both of them are quite well on their way to creating technology that's going to be able to find and return resources from asteroids. So in the long run, space tourism is going to, is going to be a drop in the bucket to the amount of money that comes from space resource harvesting. I mean, when you think about it, there is all of the uh the sunlight to be harvested without the pesky um atmosphere and there's all of the just all these resources that are out there there are asteroids individual asteroids that have more platinum in them than has ever been mined on earth and so you could send this stuff home or just leave it in space and build stuff right like yeah you know, how much money, you know, if you build or you send a robot and the robot builds more robots and those robots are able to build things in space and you get the money from that. Like it, it gets pretty crazy when you, when you sort of think about what the future could hold as this technology gets worked out. Yeah. And in a small topic change, cause I actually did see this come into my email and I was just confirming that I did see this. Um, it, what, there was a press release on this one. Um, Tempro says anyone or everyone see the Cassini news about complex hydrocarbons on mm -hmm. Enceladus. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. That was great. Now we had been tracking this. I mean, you know, Cassini, one of the great discoveries that it made was that there are these geysers coming out of, of Enceladus this mm -hmm. water ice that's blasting out of the, of the moon out into space. And about a year and a half ago, they announced that they had found hydrogen gas embedded into the, uh, in sort of, in the water and so what they think is there's hot volcanic rocks at the bottom of the ocean and they are releasing this uh this hydrogen gas into the water and then it's making its way and it's coming out of the uh out of the in the geysers as well and now the discovery that was announced yesterday was they've now found complex organic molecules also coming out of the of these geysers which really means that that these environments you know, Europa for sure, possibly Enceladus are just are looking better and better and better for for life. And so we really have to go back. And it's such a shame that we don't have we don't have a spacecraft. It's Saturn now anymore. I know. Or, you know, we have Juno, which is, you know, wrong planet. Yep. But and that's wrong Europa. capability. But Europa, I feel like and Enceladus... Europa Clipper is coming. Right. And that's going to be able to do is going to be able to search on Europa what what we would want to find on Enceladus. Yeah, I'm a little bit more impressed with Europa than I am Enceladus. Dr. Paul and I were talking about this. I feel like Enceladus mm -hmm. is a little bit of a copycat of Europa. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> and so it's the one that's, that's you know, uh, putting out the, the hydrocarbons, the, the complex organic molecules just to kind of, you know, get some attention yeah yeah we, we looked is? at yeah. yeah we looked at Europa with with Hubble and then you know we got to see Enceladus with Cassini 
Yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, I don't know if they've done it. Have they? I don't think they've done anything with Juno going by Europa. No, it's just yeah, doing it's just doing it observations of of Jupiter itself. I don't yeah. even know if it's made any observations of any of the other moons. I haven't seen them in think... those really beautiful I know. pictures that everybody's always I know. posting because they're amazing. It's actually my uh, wallpaper on my phone. Every time some a new Jupiter, yeah. you know, a new Juno picture is released, which there are tons, but yeah. um, they're so they're so gorgeous. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see. So we're, we're a few other. Well, with spaceships getting cheaper and cheaper, they can just throw away a couple hundred million by making three random cheap under tested probes and just send uh, and just send them. Or can't they? Sorry. Can't yeah. they? That was a question. Can't yeah. they just. OK. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, and so right now launch costs are such a gigantic part of the whole process that if you want to send a spacecraft like like a good example is tests right tests they were able to get the price of that spacecraft down because they were able to use a falcon 9 rocket and they were able to use it in a really kind of weird orbit that mm -hmm. the falcon 9 was flying to and so you know for 60 million dollars for your launch that left them a ton of budget because normally one of you know would they would have had to pay say to ULA three hundred million dollars for a, a a launch. So for them to be able to pay sixty million dollars to SpaceX is a is a deal, and they were able to get that mission done at all. And so as we as you know as that future comes where you can pay ninety million dollars for a Falcon Heavy launch and you could fill it with more inexpensive satellites. Uh, then, then you can kind of not have to be so careful about the engineering of the satellite, and and try to sort of get some less, you know, try to see if you can pull off missions with less complicated technology. And that's what's going to happen. The CubeSats are really kind of showing how this is going to work, right? The CubeSat people launch these tiny little spacecraft, and it's amazing what they're able to accomplish. And there's two CubeSats going to Mars now, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, up until this point, the the way that people chose the technology on their spacecraft is that it was it was more important for them to be reliable than for them to be cutting edge. And so, like the sensor on various spacecraft is actually pretty small. It's not, and the computers are very low, are very slow. Mm -hmm. Then they're, they're not as powerful as your phone. Right. <laughs> but right. they're moving to a point where people just kind of go, um, "Hey, let's try putting a phone in space." And who cares if it doesn't work? It was a phone. It's a phone. Right. Right. It, it, a phone in, in CubeSat form. And now you can even take a CubeSat and you can slice it up and you can have like a, a quarter of a CubeSat or an eighth of a CubeSat. So you can have something that's not a lot bigger than a, than a phone. Yeah, DPI, I read something about that too. I read, Yeah, he said, I read something uh, about open source enthusiasts building an open source CubeSat yeah. for around 30K. Even that's expensive. Um, we just did a story. Oh, I forget the name of the company, but they're building a space telescope for Oceanside Photo and Telescope. Those are the people who are lending me a telescope for a reasonable price. I forget the exact amount, but but so if a you know a small business can just buy a space telescope. Now it's not going to be a big telescope, right? But it's going to be in space, and, uh, and telescopes work well in space. So. So I think it's a it's it's this weird time where the launch costs are dropping dramatically. The capabilities of the spacecraft are going up exponentially. The prices are coming down on every front. So you haven't seen anything yet. And now like it feels like I'm giving my talk in Australia. Um but <laughs> no, but this is no, where we're no, getting this is, to, no, right? This is where... great cuz I think a lot of people, you know, I mean this is this is really good stuff. A lot of people I don't really talk about um, some, I mean, I read a lot of stuff and I don't really get to talk about it. Um, but yeah, no, this is good because I guess that means that we can soon just load a regular Falcon up with a micro, with micro sets and shotgun. This, <laughs> I'm putting a bunch of quotes. You probably can't see. Yeah, no, I see that. I see the, the, the comment though, right? That we yeah. can, we can just shotgun a bunch of micro satellites out into the solar system. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is is that is that communication is the is the difficulty so you can send a cubesat to mars and it can find all kinds of wonderful things and it will have no way to tell you 
because you need a big transmitter on that spacecraft to be able to send communications from Mars back to Earth or from Saturn back to Earth. But, you know, like when you think about, say, New Horizons, which is out well past the orbit of Pluto, it can only transmit at one kilobyte per second, kilobit, one mm -hmm. kilobit per second. And that's gathering the information with the 70 meter Goldstone radio dish here on Earth. So these tiny little CubeSats, they just can't, they don't have the, the oomph to be able to communicate. And so uh, one of the things that I think is going to be really important is for people to build just space infrastructure, build some, put some transmitter satellites into these various locations, put a transmitter at Saturn, put a transmitter at Jupiter, put a transmitter at Uranus, and then you can send all your little CubeSats and they can all communicate. So, yeah, someone just so, like can, can, what about putting repeaters along the way? Yeah, they'll just relay. Right. And so that's the real challenge is, is building the communications infrastructure. Like there was this great idea for these, these electric sails. They, they essentially harvest the, the power coming from the solar wind. So the solar wind is pumping out all of these energetic particles and you can sort of, uh, you can take advantage of the electric the electromagnetic push from all of these particles and you can accelerate a spacecraft out into the solar system. And so the, this group in Finland said, well, like let's send a hundred or 50 tiny little cube sats, use these electric sails and each one will go and visit five, 10 asteroids. And then three, five years later, when they'll all orbit back, you know, they'll all take these elliptical orbits to take them out into the asteroid belt and then back to earth and then when they all arrive back at Earth, then you can download all their data. So they go for five years. You don't know if they're still alive. They've, they've been told to fly past all these different asteroids, each one, gather up as many photographs as they can. And then as they come back to Earth, they dump all their data back out on, into our uh, waiting, waiting hands. So those kinds of missions are, are totally possible. But you need to... Um, you know, the more space infrastructure we can have, the better. And so it feels great that Mars actually has this, right? You've got the reconnaissance orbiter, you've got the polar, uh, sorry, you've got the the um, the insight, you've got Curiosity, mm -hmm. you've got the Mars Express, you've got all these spacecraft that can transmit back to Earth. And so you can now send spacecraft with no ability to transmit back to Earth and know that you can trust and to use the infrastructure that's already there. Exciting times ahead. Can't wait to see it. It's going to be pretty. Yeah. Cool. And I, I don't think we've seen like, it's, like on the one hand, we're super um, like, why haven't we been back to the moon? Like when, when are we going to land on Mars? Like, I think all of those things are going to take longer than people think. Yeah. Because they're dangerous and they're scary. Yeah. And the chance of human life lost is, is it's, significant. Right. But at the same time, there's going to be a bunch of things that are just going to blow your mind at how quickly they're going to come together. Mm -hmm. Right. The SpaceX is going to be building the Starlink constellation of satellites, like eventually 12,000 internet satellites that are going to provide high speed internet to any spot on earth. And they'll use their Falcon heavy or their BFR to put these up a couple of launches. I forget the math, like three launches of the BFR or something like that, or five launches. I forget the number to just like dump all of these communication satellites into space. Right. So when the prices come down that cheaply, and, and just think, like so, like right now, I don't know about you guys, I have a terrible time with my internet cell phone provider and my bandwidth provider and all this kind of stuff. Imagine hiking in the middle of the forest, right. being off the grid and having gigabit download speeds. Exactly. No matter where you are on earth. Mm -hmm. I would, so, and then what do you do with that, right? So I think everything. some of the things that we're really excited about, <laughs> you know, the, the, the sci-fi Christmas, mm -hmm aren't going to happen as quickly as we want. And other things are going to blow our minds at how quickly they arrive. Yeah. SpaceX global ec internet thing is going to be world changing. Yeah. Yeah, it will. And, and yeah. again, like a lot, a lot of the things that, you know, I even encounter and, and you probably do too is, and, and, and definitely Dr. Paul, as we saw when he was in the Ukraine, but you know, is is not being able to like to, to be able to go to these remote locations and stream some of the things in these remote locations. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a thing. Yeah, um, and it would be great to to open up the world of science. Um, yeah, because remote locations are ideal, especially for for you know astronomy, science, um, and all those. Are, there's so many other applications for that too. So I'm not saying there's nothing else, but um, I'm you know being a little. We're, I'm being selfish. 
Um, we'll get, let's That's see. That's fine. Yeah. We'll get big pipes content. Don't need more Twitter, or Instagram. I think that Twitter and uh, those, those might well, be you could do what you, do what you want right. with the internet, right? If you want to share in humanitarian projects to organize and help disaster relief in locations that are really remote and people have a hard time being able to get help, use it for that. Uh, share educational information at high quality to anywhere on the earth. So I think that you know, we're human beings and we're going to do the good stuff and we're going to do the bad stuff, right? We're going to, we're going to frivolously watch Twitch, right? Mm -hmm. And spend time sitting in front of our computers and watching Twitch when we could be outside. um, But then that's playing it in nature. Yeah. Right. No, we didn't. We, we never want to do that. We always want to make sure that we see Twitch at least uh, Skylius's channel. (laughs) Which I'm encouraging people to go outside and look at things, though. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but so I, I mean, like people, like we will always just do both. We will be, we will be, we will make things better and we'll make things worse, and that's what human beings do, and we'll sort it all out. But in general, life is amazing. It is better than it's ever been. It is the best time in the history of human society, and it's getting better by every measurement you could want to look at. You know, right. poverty rates, amount of people who've died by war, amount of, um, uh, you know, education levels, uh, people's uh, incomes, it, you know, everything, health, everything is better. There's a couple of things that are down, but really, uh, it's an amazing time and it's just going to get better. And so more internet, please. Yeah, so no FPS over satellite internet for the foreseeable future. Sorry, what was the question? <laughs> so no first person shooter over satellite internet. Well, they or will. For, yeah, not no, they totally will. I forget the second. I don't know if they're using that the, that the acronym has a few few different things. Yeah. So the plan <laughs> with this me. is that because they're low earth orbit, they actually have very low ping times. Uh-huh. And the plan is that it, there's going to be no routers. So the internet the these these uh Internet satellites are all just going to repeat. Right. And so everything that gets dumped into them, it's just going to get repeated out to everybody. Yeah. And then the trick is that you're going to have an encryption key that's going to allow you to encrypt only the information that's that's for you. Yeah. How how low are we talking though? Like uh, 200 Yeah. Like two, yeah, 200, like they're going to be 200 kilometers. They're going to be low. Yeah. Much lower than the GPS satellites. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. 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 Um, uh, and yeah. then grip grip fruit says, I don't think so. Fascism, authoritarianism are back here again in Europe. I mean, for sure there's th- some things that are bad. Um, but you can compare those like just, there's a, uh, chart. If you go to chart your world, um, look at what's happened. Uh, he's charting all of these trends that are going on mm-hmm. and just like by every measurement, everything is getting better. So How are they going there's to- absolutely some stuff that, you know, climate change is a big challenge. Yeah. Uh, ink income inequity is a big challenge. There's a ton of things that are problems, but in general, more people are better off than they've ever been. Crazy. Do you mean uh, Steven Pinker? That's what Paranora said. Do you mean Steven Pinker? No. If you go chart your world, that's Morgan Renberg. He's put together a really cool. um, Yeah, there you go. Space Force just just shared it. it. So check that out. You can see all kinds of graphs. Smoking rates, uh, poverty rates. It's kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, and for some people, right? I mean, some of us are maybe going to have to go down in income for a little while, while other people are going to be able to do a lot better. You know, the point is, like, yeah. what is best for the most people on Earth? The greater so that's good. the part that we're finding out. <laughs> uh, Stephen Pinker put a book out, uh, State of Things, Progress. Oh, cool. I haven't read it. I'd be happy to live on less so that others can have more. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the trick is like, you don't want to, you want to enjoy your, your, um, your standard of living, but you want to help other people get out of poverty. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, uh, India, I think, is just about, well, China, for example, is installing the most solar power on earth. Uh, India is just about to put in one of the largest, cheapest, uh, solar installations um like it's it's amazing what's going on around the whole planet 
So, yeah. so don't worry. Everything's fine. Everything's great and getting better. <laughs> and getting better. Yeah. Um, you're, you're in Colorado. I'm on Vancouver Island. Everyone is around the world and we're having a conversation. And 10 years ago, this wouldn't even be possible without a television network. Right. Like, how awesome is this? A lot of it's a lot of it's really really good. I think the thing I worry about is that it does take us some time to adjust as humans, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things I guess on the sociological and psychological level that we have to kind of adapt to, and at such an accelerated rate, just so fast yep. to accommodate. Yeah, no, it's it's stunning, and you know, part of it is we all have to be willing to adapt and change. Right. That, that, that life doesn't owe us anything ever. Right. That each one of us has to be ready and willing to, to adapt to everything that's coming our way. Right. Biopsychosocial. Exactly. There's so many different things to it, but it's so exciting. But I do, you know, um, with, with the internet becoming, what it is today versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah. You know, it, it, it has followed such a, a, you know, a crazy, um, I mean, development and, yeah. and it's, you know, it's just something I, I always wonder, you know, at what point, even just breaking this down on a scientific level, evolutionarily, we're not, we're, we, we haven't, you know, our changes have, have always been pretty gradual and now we have these, you know, things that just happen and you can look yeah. back five years and be like, it's complete different time. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, and it's, it's hard to even stay on top of. It is. Yeah, it absolutely <laughs> is. And it's exciting. Yeah. I'm very excited about it. Um, and I think I stay kind of neutral as far as like optimism. Um, yeah, you know, I, yeah. I, I try to stay neutral cause you know, there's, there's parts that are really, really, really awesome. And, um, but then there's I, parts about the awesomeness that's really scary. <laughs> I grew up on an island in rural, on a small island off the coast of Canada, and we didn't have electricity when I, Are you when serious? I was a kid. Yeah, yeah. So you don't even have to use the, I walked to school five miles in the snow with no shoes. I, I had to take three, had to take two ferries and three buses every day to get to school. And then you went home to no electricity. Well, we had electricity after a while. Okay. Yeah. But you know, when I was, a, when I was a baby, I don't remember. Okay. We didn't have a dishwasher in my entire childhood, and then my dad bought one when I left. But anyway, I'm right when you left, right when you left, yeah, You're like, I yeah. see what you did there, Dad. I'm like, you know, like why? Like, why'd you buy? Wait to buy a dishwasher now? And he said, "Oh, because <laughs> our other dishwasher just moved out." <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the divide between the most rich and the most poor is getting worse. It definitely is. It's a huge problem, and it needs to be solved. Yes. So, I mean, I, again, I'm not saying there aren't a pile of problems there. You know, uh, people are mentioning there's a, there's issues with drug use, deaths from drug use. And that's a problem here in Canada, too. There's issues with um, income divides and all kinds of things. There's absolutely. But if you sort of if you look at all the macro numbers that matter, crime rate, murder rate, um, uh, poverty levels, all of that, they're all moving in the right direction. So. So in general, and so the problem is that we have this really efficient news system that can seek you out in whatever corner you're at and tell you that, that, that something bad just happened. Right. 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 And, and so like my, my phone will bleep bloop at me when, you know, something's happened in some corner of the world that's bad right. because that's news mm -hmm. and it doesn't bleep bloop at you when something really good happened. Right. So, so we're yeah it, exactly it's like yeah. the Pavlov, the Pavlov's dogs. We're, yeah, we're, we're exactly. getting this this sensory to the bad yeah. things, um, but yeah that's I mean that all this stuff is is I, I mean again I'm super excited for a lot of this stuff but I also see like you know there's there's a lot of trust and we have to have a lot of trust <laughs> all around though um, yeah with the well I know you guys technology. are going through a hard time right now like I know in the states it's tough and mm -hmm. and you know you're. Uh, even though we're having some issues now, mm -hmm. uh, us here in Canada and you down in the States, we're, we're rooting for you and, uh, we look forward to you, look forward to you guys sort of getting through this situation that you're in and sort of having a, a place where you can be more of a single society. Like, I think the division is sad and I it's know. too bad. I know. And I would love to sort of see 
the people on both sides of the of the aisle come back together and be more moderate but maybe that's just my you know canadian no, no. apology you know no, sorry it'd be nice really it'd be sorry. nice yeah it would be <sighs> nice um but i think that is that oh my god that's gosh. our hour that was our hour yeah that flew by all right that always was, always fun yeah because with dr paul i'm always like so you know oh man you've got another 15 minutes don't tell him <laughs> i said that i'm just kidding <laughs> he's like you're just trying to get me off the show sky um guys this is fraser you guys can find him there's the guest link there's all the stuff there i highly suggest following his twitter and also he's got great video content um on his you'll see all of the links right there right we're dropping there. a new video i hope within the next couple of hours. In fact, I see a message from Chad. Maybe it's ready to go. Uh, so we're going to be dropping. So it's going to be in situ resource utilization, which is um, uh, harvesting resources from space. Yeah. And so living off the land in space. And that's going to be happening uh, in just a couple of, of hours. And then the next one that we're working on is space navigation. So from how, how do spacecraft find their way in space and what are some really cool future ideas to do that as well. So that's coming up next week. Yeah, and, and, and they're great. They're great. I mean, we use these videos all the time. So and then we pause them and they're amazing pauses. <laughs> for, for, with hilarious facial expressions. <laughs> yeah, so definitely yeah. if you guys, a lot of people ask me, where do you get space news? Where do you get good resources? His Twitter feed is amazing. Universe Today and also, uh, that's also a separate Twitter. Um, yeah. And then also going to his his YouTube, which is listed right here um, in that that link there. So, so we won't see you next week. You won't see me next week. I don't know. I'm going to be a shattered wreck of a human being i don't even know what like what time it'll be but i will so put me down as a maybe but almost certainly not and okay. then and then the next two weeks we're going to be traveling around australia so i will definitely be offline mm -hmm. and then i'll be back okay and then, uh, and then we'll be hanging out again awesome well thank you for your time and i will catch up with Always you soon all right all see right, you later everyone there. bye so i'm not leaving but that's fraser and you guys all know him he is a regular on here, so it's not just a one-time thing. We have regulars. We have amazing regulars.